All right. So we are back live. Uh, please give us just one more second to kind of get ourselves situated here for everybody in the community. Uh, again, uh, if you're new to the AV Educates, uh, AV Tech Talks, I welcome you to communicate with us in the chats. This is a live forum for you guys and us as well. We'll be talking about QLabs in particular. Um, again, I'd like to welcome everybody back to the AV Tech Talks every Monday at seven o'clock, uh, hosted by myself, Omar Colom, Ed Wallach, and Christopher Brown. Uh, we are here for you guys. This is meant for you, and this is helping you guys and ourselves as well. Uh, so real quick, uh, this is me, Omar Colon, the creator of AV Educates. This is our IT guy, Christopher Brown, the streaming IT guy. And a brand of the operation is Ed Wallach over here. I'll, just, I'll let you guys meet them in a second. And our special guest for tonight is Ori Ben Summon, uh, the QLabs operator. And just before we jump into that, guys, I want to go over a quick house rules for the audience. We go live to Facebook every Monday at 7 p.m. Again, we go live to Facebook every Monday at 7 p.m. Uh, recordings go um, past that to uh, YouTube. Uh, join the Zoom room by texting 407-504-7690. Again, if you want to be a part of the panelists and be on this, please text us at 407-504-7690, and we'll put that in the comments as well if anybody else needs that. Next on the house rules is uh, do the nature of streaming, right? Uh, this, there's a bit of a delay between what we see in our Zoom room and when it is, hits the Facebook. So uh, please be aware that we will come to your questions. We will answer as many as we can. We try to be as transparent about that as possible. We will ask your question exactly how you ask it uh, to our panelists, to our QLabs expert tonight. Um, be the sharpshooter in the room. If you have a question, ask it. If, you, if we say something correctly, let us know. Uh, this isn't, we aren't the know all, know all to know all knowledge here. We are the distributors of it. So if you have a question for us, ask us, we will answer it. If we see something you think is wrong, let us know. We'll talk about it within the chat live with you and the audience members. Uh, we don't know everything. Again, like I just said, we, we don't have all the answers here. We are helping the community out by providing what is asked of us. So please ask your questions whenever you'd like. This is a live Q&A session uh, led by Ori. The whole session is a live Q&A. Again, I've said this three times already. I won't dive too deep into that. And a shameless plug, follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram as we can grow bigger and collaborate with even more amazing people. Or we met through, obviously, Facebook. So the more people we meet, the more people that volunteer for this, the more we can get this out to the community. Uh, very special thank you to Ori as well. And that is the end of my house rules. I will now bring us to the panelists. And here are our panelists. And again, a special thanks to Ori for being here. Thank you, Bodhi. Andres, Ed, Scott, Justin, Nick, Jason, Robert, Andre, Freddie, and Schumacher right now. Thank you so much for being here, guys. Thank you for being our panelists. Thanks for being live for us. Thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, before I just keep talking here, everybody, I will dump over to uh, Ed, Ed Wallach over here real quick to let us talk a little bit more about Ori um, before we jump into the main event with the Q-Labs. Great. Hi, I hope everybody's doing all right. Um, Ed Wallach here. Uh, I invited uh, Ori to come and talk to us about Q-Lab. Um, Outside of the theater community, I don't see uh, QLab used as much um, as it should be because it's a super powerful program. Um, I regularly use it when I'm A1ing to do play-ons, uh, VOGs, uh, things like that. Um, and in theater, we use it for video and, and a host of other things. Um, I think later too, we may hear from Justin who can maybe tell us some interesting use cases that he's had for QLab. Uh, so I invited Justin also to speak on that. Um, but yeah, no, and, uh, Ori is a, a great all around tech. That's why I invited him. I wanted all you guys to meet him. So, uh, I'm just going to kick it to Ori and, uh, let him take it from there. Uh, unless Bodhi, you got anything? Oh, Ori kick ass today. Thanks guys. Uh, Hey everybody. Uh, so I am here today to show you the basics of how to use QLab um, so that you can then incorporate it into your live streams. Uh, so I'm going to cover the basics of the UI and the settings and uh, the handful of cues that you'll probably be using the most often uh, when you're running live streams. So let's start by talking about QLab. Um, QLab, uh, and Ed can send out the link if you haven't uh, clicked it already from the initial event. Uh, this is their homepage, QLab.app. QLab is a very powerful piece of playback software. Um, you can run 
uh, sound, video, lights. Uh, you can output DMX and ArtNet uh, as of a couple years ago. Um, you can output network queues. Uh, you can run AppleScript. Uh, it is a Mac only program, um, but it is super powerful. Um, so you can download a copy if you haven't already on the homepage. Uh, and today you guys will be following along with the free version. Uh, another link that uh, Ed can send out is for the features by license type. You can see what the free version gives you here is probably just enough to fill most of your needs. Um, you will probably end up needing a pro video license to run uh, an actual live stream, but you can program for free um, and you can get QLab. Uh, the full license is a few hundred dollars. Uh, I think it's 400, but uh, you can rent QLab uh, prorated. So every rental you make is a payment towards that $400. Um, and for just the video license, uh, you can rent it for oops, $4 a day. Um, so if you want to set up in, in the free version, uh, you'll use an audition window, which we'll get into um, to build your video cues. Uh, but um, then you will only need to pay the $4 when you're actually going to hook up to OBS and output the stream. I'm not going to cover how to hook up to OBS today directly. Uh, that's covered very thoroughly in this document. Um, another link that Ed can send out uh, of how to live stream with QLab. Uh, it involves integrating with OBS and Soundflower. Um, and there is also yet another link uh, here on YouTube, which is a Q&A session uh, given by one of the uh, programmers and the guy who writes all of the manuals for QLab, uh, Sam Kuznets. Uh, so you can follow along with him on video in, in uh, actually setting OBS up. Um, if you want to get into a deeper dive after today, you can reference the QLab cookbook, uh, which has a bunch of very interesting uh, workspaces or recipes, uh, as they're called here, uh, for um, exploring what QLab can do at its fullest. Uh, and finally, if you want to take a very deep dive, I strongly recommend checking out uh, Jeremy Hopgood's book, QLab 4, Projects in Video, Audio, and Lighting Control. Um, even after using the program for years, I learned plenty just reading through it. Um, so now that we've stepped through all of that, I'm going to Sorry, hey, Ori, which, uh, which of the links did you want me to post so far? No, no. Uh, all of them. Sure. Thank you, Ed. No problem. I like that book reference a lot. Uh, can you tell me a little more about the book before we go any further? I'm sorry. Uh, Jeremy Hopgood is, uh, he's a fairly renowned, uh, QLab programmer within the community. Uh, and he wrote uh, the textbook, the only textbook that exists uh, on QLab, um, which is the uh, uh, project in video, audio, and lighting control. Uh, he wrote uh, the QLab 3 version as well. So this is the second edition of the book. Um, nice. The book is highly recommended, highly valuable, and the author is uh, definitely involved deep into QLabs. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, he, he's, a, he's a far, far greater programmer than I. Um, but uh, it, it really is just full of information about uh, how to use the program uh, most effectively, uh, how to stitch shortcuts together, um, and how to creatively work around some things. Uh, Jeremy Hopgood is actually also very active in the, uh, the QLab Google group, 
which is where uh, a lot of the online troubleshooting for QLab happens. Uh, if you're not emailing with them directly, uh, the QLab support team responds within the Google group directly, uh, directly there. That's awesome. I didn't know that. Thank you for that. Yep. Um, I got to say too, doing the, the rent to own licensing, I use that all the time. Um, it's, it's a really, if you, if you're not familiar with that kind of model, it's great. Uh, you, if you just need it for a couple of shows or a couple of days, you can just pay for the days that you need. Um, you can still do your, uh, your programming on the free version. It, um, using the audition window, it's a little cumbersome, but at $4 a day for a video license, I think, uh, if you rent all three, what is it, Ori? Do you know it's, uh, like, uh, I 10 bucks. I believe it's like, uh, 10 or 12 bucks. Something I think like that. it's $12 a day uh, if memory serves. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I usually do the two license, which ends up being like seven fifty or eight bucks in the, the audio and video. I usually don't need the lighting myself, but yeah, it's 10 yeah, per no. day. You're right. 10 per day. Yeah. So that makes sense. So uh, yeah, no, that, that model is great. You're not locked into, um, you know, paying a high price for the, uh, the full program. You can get the features you need uh, and it, counts towards eventually owning it. So you basically, you, you rent it a hundred times and it's paid for itself and then you're all set. So um, really, really cool. If you're not familiar with it, um, you're not locked in and spending a ton of money to get your feet wet on this thing. So. Robert Schumacher here. I got a question. I'm sorry. Did you say you can use this on a PC or it's only Mac based? It is a Mac only program. Thank you. You know, Ori, I don't. I didn't hear you. Did you mention about that it you can do um, some video mapping? Yes. Uh, okay. Yes, you can do some video mapping. Uh, you can do uh, perspective mapping. You can even get as fine as uh, as Bezier. You can do blending uh, right. with QLab as well for multiple surfaces. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I was I was copy pasting things, so I wasn't sure if uh, you touched on that, but. Uh, I'll let you get going and stop interrupting you now. Thanks. Uh, so I'm going to try to get through the nitty gritty of the UI and uh, the workspace settings uh, as quickly as possible so that we can get down to the fun stuff, which is actually building queues. Um, so if you downloaded QLab and you're following along, or if you're just watching me, uh, when you open the program for the first time, you're going to see this window minus what I've put here. Um, at the top of the screen, we have uh, playback information and the go button. Uh, generally, when I'm programming and, and firing cues in QLab, I will use the space bar as my go button. Um, that is pre-programmed uh, to run, but if you want to be uh, particular about when your cues are fired, you can mouse up here and click the go button and disable the space bar. Um, up here is the cue name field. Uh, this will tell you whatever cue you have selected. So whatever is going to fire when you click go or hit space bar. Um, and here you have the notes field, uh, which is something that you can generate to help whoever is going to be firing the cues if it's not you. Um, down here we have the toolbar. This is where we have all of the cues that we can add into QLab. Uh, so we have group cues, audio cues, mic cues, and you can see they all have these handy little tool tips to let you know exactly what they are. Um, we're going to take a look at this queue here. This queue is laid in the queue list. You see it takes up one of these lines. Um, every queue is a line in the queue list. Uh, the parameters that you see here, um, first of all, you see the playhead. This little triangle here indicates exactly where you're selected. And you can also see the readout of me having selected queue up top. Um, this is the queue type here, and to the left of it, though I have nothing there right now, that's where you'll see any uh, queue status issues. So if the queue is loaded, if the queue is errored, 
um, and you can mouse over whatever icons show up here to find out exactly what the issue is. Um, here you have the queue number. The queue number uh, is not important in terms of the order in which the queues are fired. Uh, the queue number is a way that QLab can reference that queue programmatically. So you can have other queues that will reference that queue or target that queue. Um, and that number is how QLab knows where to point itself. Um, and then here we have the name of the queue. I've named this queue Q very uncreatively. Um, over here, you can't do this on the memo queue, but we have the target. Uh, so generally, if you have a media queue, uh, like a uh, video file or an audio file that you're going to want to uh, target a sound queue or a video queue to, then you'll click an icon in this target column, and we'll show you that soon. Um, we have pre-wait and post-wait, which are uh, timers that you can program in. So before the actual action of the queue takes place or after it, before QLab releases it. Um, and finally, we have the continue, auto continue, and auto follow rules. Uh, basically, so if I have do not continue selected and I fire this queue, the next queue will just be ready to fire at my whim. Um, if I were to select auto follow, then when this queue finished, action and post wait included, the next queue would then fire. Um, and if I were to select auto continue, then this queue and the next queue would both fire at the same time. Um, down here, we're just going to take a look at the inspector window. This is where you'll uh, be able to adjust the settings of any of your queues, and you can pop this out if you like. I generally like to keep it all in one display. Um, but uh, the two tabs that you'll see on every single queue are the basics and triggers tabs. Uh, so that's what we'll go over, the number, key, the number of the queue, and we can set this to whatever we want. Um, it's not limited to actual numbers. Um, I, could, I could make this Q number Q, um, and I can reference that Q number Q um, anywhere else within within this workspace, um, or externally. Uh, and here we have the duration, the pre-wait, the post-wait, all these parameters that we see up here. Um, you can set your cues to auto load if it's going to be uh, a high-res video. Um, generally because QLab doesn't like playing back H.264 or the, uh, the better compression formats. It really likes ProRes or uh, more recently, uh, HAP works well. Um, so because of that, uh, you might want to check uh, auto load if you have a high resolution video that you're going to play. Otherwise, uh, your performance isn't likely to be terribly impacted by missing that. But it also might clean things up uh, if you find uh, a queue sequence stuttering. Hey, Ori. Um, yes. Um, just because you were mentioning uh, how QLab prefers the ProRes, um, would it be too difficult to show how to transcode from a Mac if you, um, if you get a file that's stuttery or won't play? No. No, it would not. Um, I, don't, I don't know if everybody knows this, this cool little trick. So... Um, you may have to, because you're not sharing your whole desktop, <clears throat> you may have to unshare for a moment I, and I, then. Oh, no, there you go. Yeah. Um, so we'll come in here and I'll just re encode one of the files that I have here already. Um, right at the bottom. Yeah, thank you, Ed. I lost it. Uh, so you can click encode selected video at the bottom of that tier. I can pick what I want to encode it to. All of these are options, but I'm going to choose Apple ProRes because that's what QLab likes most. Um, how, how big a file is that? It may take a little bit if it's uh, huge. It's only about 10 seconds. Oh, great. Uh, yeah, that, that'll be quick. Yeah. Um, 
And this video uh, doesn't have any transparency built in, so I don't need to worry about preserving that. Um, so right there, that's worth the price of admission uh, for is. tonight. Um, you just learned how to transcode to a ProRes because a, a program like Handbrake won't do ProRes. Um, you can't handbrake something into a ProRes format. So your Mac can do that natively. I think if you're uh, anything beyond 10.10, .10. I think that's when that started. I think that is when the, yeah. I know I was on Yosemite for a while, which was 10.10 .10, and I was able to do it on mine. Um, I don't remember if I could do it on 10.9, but if you're on 10.10, .10, even though I only just upgraded, uh, you should be upgrading already but not to Catalina. No, definitely not to Catalina. Don't make the mistake I made. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so coming back here, um, the last thing on the basics tab we wanna look at is the notes. I mentioned that up here. You can either enter them up there or down here, um, but you can enter whatever notes you want in that field. And then when that queue is selected in the queue list, that will come up. Um, so if it's something like, uh, if it's something that needs to be uh, taken on a visual queue, or if it's something that needs to wait for somebody to start speaking, for instance, you might want uh, to throw a note in there in addition to the queue title, just to let you know what rules to follow before you hit go. Um, so now we're going to hop over to the triggers tab. Uh, the triggers tab, as you can see, is split in two. Uh, on the left side, we have uh, events that you can set to trigger whatever queue you have selected. You can set a hotkey on your computer uh, as long as it doesn't conflict with something that QLab already has reserved. Um, you can hook up a MIDI device and set a MIDI trigger um, and listen for a note. Um, you can set it to run on a wall clock trigger if, for instance, you have an installation running. Um, and you can set that to run on any number of days of the week. And you can set it to listen to time code, which, uh, Justin, um, I think you might have uh, some more insight on that. Um, yeah, time code. Well, time code basically goes against the spirit of QLab in a lot of ways because you're trying to run queues. What QLab does not do that's critical, it's a trigger. It is sitting there waiting for one frame of time code to go by. Um, unlike a lot of editing software, it will not chase time code. It won't jump forward to it, it won't jump back, it just waits for that one frame and then goes. And the other thing to be very cautious about it with is it's not aware of timecode format. If it's generating, it is, but if you're doing something like running 30 frame drop, it doesn't know about the dropped frame. So you can tell it, you know, go two minutes, zero seconds, frame zero, and it'll sit there all day and watch the timecode go by. So. Yeah, it's, it's a useful trigger, but it's not what QLab does best, but it is there when you want to use it. Thank you, Justin. Um, so over here on the right side of the column, uh, we can see uh, the actions uh, that you can configure to take place when the queue is triggered. Um, so for instance, when this queue is triggered, you can have it fade and stop uh, all peers, all other queues within this queue list, um, or all queues in your workspace. Uh, and I'll show you lists uh, as soon as we get past this. Um, and you can set the uh, time for that fade and stop to occur. Uh, you can do the same with ducking the audio of other queues. Uh, so if, for instance, you have an audio track that needs to come up over some music, uh, rather than building a fade up for one and a fade down for the other, uh, then you can just build the fade up for the, uh, 
for the vocal track probably and uh, set it to duck other cues um, so that it'll dominate. Uh, and then finally, uh, if running a second trigger, we won't really deal with this too much tonight, but I will say uh, if you need to build yourself a soundboard uh, or a sampler, uh, this is the way to do it. Uh, if you come over here and set uh, on a second trigger, EQ hard stops and restarts, um, you can throw this into, uh, this is actually a nice segue. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and hit Command L. Uh, you can also bring this up by uh, going to View, Lists, Carts, and Active Cues. Uh, so what I was saying about the sampler, uh, QLab uh, has what's called Cue Carts, uh, which is a feature that used to be part of a different program. Um, and I think QLab bought them and uh, integrated their software uh, into their own. Um, but these are basically uh, buttons that you can set. And this is very handy if you have an iPad uh, or an iPhone, uh, you can run the QLab remote app and you can use these as, uh, as a uh, board of hits uh, that you can take on the fly rather than having them in a sequential queue list. Um, like an old cart machine or, or yeah. like a sounding board. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Ed. So if you're doing, if you're a streamer, you can have an iPad with this set up and then you know, just a quick button press, uh, you know, off to your side and, and make that happen very quickly and easily instead of uh, having to plan on what you want. You can, you can have all the air horn samples you want, you know, and, uh, and be able to, to tap on them and, and have them just go. So that's, uh, it's pretty cool. Yep, exactly. And uh, you can even build sequences, which we'll get into more. Uh, with group cues, you can't build a group cue here, but you can number that group cue and then come back here and use a start cue and target whatever sequence you've built. Um, so I can get back into that uh, later when it makes a little more sense uh, if people like. Um, more on this panel over here. Uh, you see now I have cue cart in here with a broken cue because uh, I did not configure it correctly. Uh, it doesn't have a target or anything. And you can see if I mouse over this X, uh, it tells me that a cue in the cart is broken. And if I mouse over this X, Well, it's not telling me over here, but it is telling me down here that I have no target key set. And that is the problem with this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and delete it and come back here to the new queue list. Um, I'm going to show you guys this here. Only shows up when you pull up your, your list view and your active queues view. Um, I like to keep that open when I'm programming. I find it very handy. Uh, because if you come over here to the Active Cues tab, um, I'm going to go ahead and run a sequence that you're not going to see yet. Uh, you'll probably hear the beginning of, but you will see a lot of activity in the Active Cues tab. And I just panicked all of that out. But uh, so you can have individual control um, over any queue that is currently active in here. Um, you can scrub through it. Uh, you can pause or kill a queue individually. Um, and then your controls up here allow you to reset all queues to their uh, unplayed state. Um, you can pause all queues. So if you have a whole sequence running, you hit this. It'll just put the brakes on everything. Um, use this to resume all, and then this is a panic all, which is what I did with the escape key. Uh, the escape key is hard programmed into QLab that is absolutely 
the hot key for panic and there is no way to change that it is it is locked in in the mapping um but it is a very useful key so it's good to remember uh another good thing to note about panic is that uh in your in your qlab preferences came up on a different screen um you can uh you can configure the, oh, I'm sorry, no, it's in your workspace settings. You can configure the duration of your panic. So my panic is currently set to zero seconds. Um, that's all I really wanna get into on the, on the general page. I will dip into audio and video just because that's what, what's gonna help us uh, get up and running. Uh, so on your audio page, um, you'll want to make sure that whatever device you're outputting uh, locally uh, for your sound is uh, what you have selected if you want to play along. Um, if, uh, if not, if you're just planning on doing this in, uh, with OBS, then you'll need to integrate it with Soundflower. Um, but for the Zoom broadcast, I have Zoom audio device looped into mine. Um, hey, Ori. Yes. Uh, I just want to see if, uh, cause we just, we went through a lot because there is so much in QLab. Does anybody uh, in the, in the room have any questions um, that uh, they want to ask uh, or anybody on Facebook? I see Bodhi and then I see Andreas. So yeah, my question, or you were talking, when you were talking about the soundboard, soundboard is a great option, something that been going over a little bit here. Um, but when you're and Ed was talking about using it as a streamer, when you're playing and you're doing things and you're going, it's kind of hard for you to reach over and hit something to send off that sounder. Is there a way you can timestamp it? Like just to make stupid sounders go off when you, you, out of nowhere, just random timestamp sounders. You can absolutely set timestamps to it. Uh, you can, uh, you can set timestamps to it. If you want, you can even, uh, you can record a cue sequence. So you can run the cues at the time sequence that you would want to hear them. Um, and when you record the cue sequence, uh, it'll output it to a timeline group cue. Um, and then it will play that reliably uh, the way that you ran it every time. Um, you can uh, you can also configure cues to uh, accept OSC input or UDP input. Um, so if you can configure an event from another device uh, or another QLab machine, um, in some cases, uh, then you can uh, set the triggers based on that. As long as you're hooked up to the same network, uh, you can communicate via OSC. QLab has a very, very robust uh, OSC dictionary um, also on their webpage, uh, which I did not give Ed that link, um, but it is under the uh, documentation header. Um, and you can take pretty full control of the program uh, right down to building queues and setting their parameters. Sorry, which program? Because I'll, I'll find that link. What was it? Uh, that was the uh, OSC dictionary on, uh, on QLab's homepage. Copy. Thanks, Ed. So just to jump in real quick, Corey, I saw when you're going to the queue cart, um, that program I haven't really used myself, but it looked familiar. Is that one where if you're doing like a VOG on the spot, you can use to record something if you had a, a microphone to load into that cue cart on the fly if you owned uh, Q Labs? Um, I wouldn't. You could probably find a way to record it on the fly, um, but uh, you could uh, pick up. You you could uh, unmute a mic. Uh, on the fly that way. Um, you could apply an effect to it. Uh, you could do both at the same time. Uh, but as far as I know, and Justin, maybe you have a little more insight. Uh, 
I think it would take uh, a good bit of doing to get it to record uh, as well. Yeah, that would definitely take some doing. Um. So, so for instance, when you're reviewing the the cue card in general, you know, are you usually getting pre-made content that you're throwing up there and using that as your as your 360, 360 playback system? Is that how you guys use the cue card when you're using Q Labs? Uh, typically, uh, yeah. What I actually use uh, the cue card most for personally uh, is I will build uh, cue sequences, uh, like scenes, basically, um, and I might build them on their own on their own cue lists, um, or I might just build them in a group and put that group on a queue list with some others. Um, but uh, generally what I'll do is I'll set uh, play cues to those groups. Um, so for instance, uh, I, do, uh, I do an astronomy show every year. And one thing I was working with uh, last year was running queue lab cues that took siphon input um looped back from my own machine running uh a presentation for the presenters um and so i would have that look and then i would have a cue sequence that i built that was basically an ad reel for the sponsors um and that included some lighting cues uh that were triggered upstairs uh, that was a group queue with a bunch of OSC queues, network queues uh, that ran to other devices. Um, but that one trigger set that whole look for, for us. Um, so I could take that on my iPad backstage as soon as I could see that the presenter was starting to walk off and it would change the lighting, it would play the, the house music and it would uh, change my presentation over to the ad reel and unmute that at the board. Got it, got it. So it does more than just audio. It's got multiple functionalities. Yes, yeah. Um, you just got to program that look and then throw it in there. And then that's how, that's kind of like, I guess for the video world, it'd be like my, my preset buttons. Once right. I've created, I, or my macros for an ATM, once I've created, I just have a button now and my whole list, my whole queue gets to just run through. Right. QLab is a great, great program for playback. Um, for live work, uh, it gets a little dicier if you're trying to generate content on the fly. Um, it can be done. I actually worked with somebody a couple of years ago who basically used it as a VJ. Um, and it was one of the most impressive displays I've seen backstage. But uh, he was uh, changing effects. He was screen sharing in from another computer and he was generating uh, backgrounds and content and he was layering them in to the QLab file one at a time uh, while the artists played on stage. Um, so it is, it is possible to use it uh, in that very quick and speedy live way. Um, but it, it takes a lot of experience to get there. You really have to know the program very inside and out. Uh, QLab is, is fantastic if you can put a little preparation in. Um, if you can anticipate all of the looks that you're going to need, you can program all of those sequences in and iron them out and make them perfect and they will play back exactly as you want them to. Right, so that's a big reason why it's big in the theater world because theater world, everything's on a kind of a, a, a shot list or a cue, a cue list, right? And they're, they're doing each scene, scene by scene. So you're able to create those in rehearsal over and over again, modify it little by little. And then the day of the show or the day of the play, you're there just hitting the go button. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Um, but uh, as I said, personally, I, I love it as a, as a control interface uh, for a lot of the media that I run. Um, and being able to trigger it remotely and use it to trigger other events remotely uh, has been uh, probably my favorite feature of the last uh, of the last 
three versions <laughs> that I've uh, that I've been with them for. Um, Got it. No, I, I like that a lot. That that's really cool. That and that's me learning something because I'm not a big QLab user. I, I know of it. I've I've played around with it, but I'm not a really big user of it in, in a live scenario myself either. Um, I saw Robert. You had your hand up. Yeah, I was wondering. Can you um, can you show how you do the trimming of in and out for the video? The the trimming. Oh, for for like on like when the video starts and stops. Is that what you're asking? Uh, oops, yeah. I'm sorry. What? Correct. Yes. Uh, yep. So the next thing that we're getting to is building cues, and I was going to start with audio, but I've, I'm running a little long, so. Let's start with video. Um, I'm gonna take a video cue and drop it in. And now I'm gonna go ahead and target that video file. Or pick a video file to target. Uh, I think this might be getting in my way. No, interesting. Um, QLab occasionally will get a little buggy. Um, I'm just going to see if it will accept the file directly. Because that's another way that you can add files. Uh, you can just drag and drop them in. Yep, there we are. Uh, and additionally, I could have come down here. Um, for some reason, that cue didn't populate when I dropped it in, but I could have come down here and selected the target uh, had anything showed up. Um, so uh, here we have, you see some additional tabs. Um, you want to get into trimming the start and stop, then we'll look at the time and loops tab, which is actually where if this video had any sound, uh, we would see the waveform for it. Um, but this is actually the waveform editor. Um, with our waveform editor here, we can set infinite loop. We can set a play count for the whole thing. Um, we can mark in and out. And we can either hit M or we can add slice. Um, and we can set the number of times those slices will play through. Um, we can create by putting in a zero value infinite loops. Um, so that is, uh, that's the basics of the, uh, of the waveform editor. Now, as far as setting the trim on whatever you're playing, you've got uh, trim marks on the out and the in um, that you can sequence to wherever you want. Um, this video, it actually doesn't particularly matter where I start um, if I run it on an infinite loop. Before I run this video, let's take a look at the display and geometry tab and make sure that my video surface is correct. Is the other thing in here, if we go to the video tab in our workspace settings, um, you'll see I have two video surfaces configured. One is my main display. I know that's what it is. It's 1440 by 900. Um, and one is the display that I am uh, outputting to for QLab. Uh, and that is 2048 by 1536. Um, here you can also set camera patches for live input devices. My FaceTime camera is configured down here. Um, I'm not going to dig too deeply into camera cues or mic cues uh, because they will function largely the same as uh, sound and video cues uh, for these purposes. Um, but now that I know that this is the surface that I want to output to, I can come out of here and say surface two. Yes, that is correct. That's where I want this to go. I see my opacity for the video is set to 100%. And currently, I am configured with full surface mode. And you can see that this blue rectangle is the full raster of my display. 
Um, it's the full size of the Im of, of the surface that I have configured. Um, so if I want to come in here and change that, I've got to switch it to custom geometry. And now that I have it in custom geometry, I can change any number of parameters. I can change the scale. I can unlock the scale and change it directionally. Um, uh, I can change the anchor point. I can even come in here to do any of these things. Uh, I can change the anchor point. I can drag the image around within the display um, to position it. Uh, so for instance, uh, if I have uh, like a PNG, I can resize that and position it. Um, the anchor point is uh, more important once we get into the fade cues a little later. Um, but we can also set the rotation of the image if we like. Um, and I can click in that field and drag around or I can uh, actually input a value. Um, but you can see it's pivoting on the anchor that I set. Um, I'm going to reset that value. I'm going to set the anchor back to zero, zero. Um, and I'm going to set myself back to full surface. Uh, before I actually fire the cue, I'm going to, for myself, I'll use the shortcut, which is Command Shift A. And that brings up what's called the audition window, um, which is extra useful if you're following along with the free license at home, um, because you can configure it for whatever displays you want in the free version, but you cannot output to anything but your Surface One, which is your main display by default. Um, if you use an audition window, you can visualize all of your cues uh, without needing to license the software before you actually use it for an event. Um, so you, you, here you see I have fit to video or fit, a fit to screen is an option. I actually like it at the 20% that I had it. Um, the audio patch can be shared, uh, so you can also preview audio as part of um, your audition window, and you can set it to float so that going back and forth and selecting things in QLab, you don't lose what's happening on the screen. Um, so now that I've set all of that video and I've brought in my audition window, I can hit go, and you can see the video on my Surface 2. Um, I would like to note that uh, while you're running the audition window, you see it says audition up here. Um, that's part of why it lets you get around the, uh, the free license uh, so that you can preview your content. It is not actually outputting on the Surface that it's patched to right now. It only shows up in the audition window when you use that feature. Um, so it's really only for building, uh, building cue sequences, seeing how things are going to look as a preview. Um, but if you want to run your cues, uh, well, let's hope you program them beforehand. Um, so we're just a step in real quick. I apologize. Yes. I don't want to let this one get too far ahead of us. So I have a question on the Facebook side. Um, I feel like obviously there's an answer for this already because you've been going over this, but uh, one of the AV trainer asks, uh, QLabs versus Playback Pro. And I'll ask him for a little more detail on that. Uh, he also asks QLabs versus Disguise, uh, also known as D3. Uh, what are your uh, kind of thoughts, I guess, on that when it comes to functionality uh, for QLabs versus Playback Pro? Um. I prefer the functionality of QLab uh, mainly because of what I was talking about before um, in terms of being able to uh, script instances to build a complex sequence uh, that can run um, and uh, being able to uh, interface um, with other desks uh, easily. Um, the OSC scripting in QLab works very, very well. 
uh, anything that I haven't been able to do with OSC um, within QLab and anything that I've needed to incorporate another program on my, on my machine to do. As long as that other program runs Apple Script, I can loop that in seamlessly because um, QLab will run uh, Apple Script queues as well. Oh, I don't know. That's awesome. Uh, me as a playback user, obviously, I, Playback Pro is just a simple playing. You know, you upload a file, you play it back. There's not much you can do with it. Summary sizing you can do. Uh, AV Educate did a video about a, maybe a year ago now on how to run AV Playback. It was a whole hour long thing. It's not as uh, versatile as QLabs is. And some of the things you're showing me right now are things that you couldn't even do in Playback Pro. So these are you know, above and beyond. And j just to to iterate that, you know, Justin, do you have any of your thoughts on comparisons between Playback Pro and uh, QLabs particularly or Disguise? Uh, I feel like QLabs might be just below Disguise, but not at that level of what Disguise is. I don't really have anything to add there. When we're talking to me, I'm more of an audio user. Video, uh, Ori is much more on the video side. Got you, got you. Okay, that's fine. So yeah, yeah, Ori, I guess I'll, you know, I'll, I'll dive it back into your, your ballpark here with... Um, yeah, I, I actually answered um, AV, uh, AV Trainer on there. Um, they're very different animals, Playback Pro and uh, QLab. So Playback Pro, you're only going to be able to display to one surface um, at a time, and you can't layer video and audio. So you can't have two th – I mean, yeah, yes, you can create fades so they somewhat overlap, um, but you can't actually trigger two simultaneous cues um, the same way in Playback Pro. Um, in the corporate world, uh, Playback Pro is still kind of, you know, the thing. Um, and for simple shows, it's great. Um, but if you, uh, you know, without having a media server, if you wanted to play four different video tracks and layer them as pips, one on top of each other, you could do that in uh, QLab where you wouldn't be able to do that in Playback Pro. Um, you have far more geometry uh, capabilities in QLab things like that. So they are very different animals. As far as being, uh, his second question was, uh, you know, uh, dis versus Disguise or Modelo Pi. Um, so it's it's almost like a media server light that runs natively on your machine. So yes, you have a lot of features and a lot of things you can do, um, but you're limited to the capabilities of your machine, your graphics card or, or eGPU. Um, and QLab actually really likes your machine to be set up a certain way. Uh, that's it's on their page, but there's uh, there's certain things they want you to do so that you're going to have the best and most stable uh, experience running it. Yeah, um, there is there is a guide on their page on on how to do that and get the the best experience out of it. Uh, there's also a as I said, QLab can run scripting queues, so they provide a workspace uh, on their website. Um, which can be downloaded uh, that will run scripts to prepare your computer for a show uh, before you actually get into playing the actual, uh, like the content of your show. Ori, sorry, yeah. we, had, we had a question. Um, uh, maybe Robert wants to ask this uh, about scrubbing video to mark in and out points. Um, is that possible? Um, yes. Uh, I know you showed us in the audio editor, and I'm sorry to go backwards. It's just before we uh, before we get too far along. Right. You know, uh, I think it'll be easier to show you with a with a sound cue. So that's what I will do. Sure. Um, I think he's specifically wondering about video, though. Are you able to? Yes, but the uh, so so the way that uh, timing is dictated in QLab, uh, it, it they're they're both on the waveform editor as I was saying. Um, the the video looks no different than the audio, except there's no sound on this video that I have. Um, and so here you actually have something other than a straight line to tell you the story. Um, so as far as scrubbing around to find uh, find your trim position, uh, so I'm gonna. Well, first I'm gonna go ahead and drop the volume of this way down. Uh, Thank you. Because <laughs> we don't really need to hear it right now. This is just a demo. Um, 
and I'm going to play that track, and I can see it playing here. Um, and it is soft enough that I can barely hear it in my headphones. But, okay, say I have found the spot. Visually, the track is playing back, and now I know exactly where I want. Let's see. Is it going to be here? No. Is it going to be here? No, it's off by a second or two. Now I can scrub around there um, directly on the waveform and then, you know, not have to move too far to be able to make my mark. Um, or I can scrub around here, which is a little bit easier to move around and manipulate. Um, and as the cue, uh, uh, as this needle moves through the track, um, I can use that hotkey that I mentioned, M, or click here to add a slice when I hit the position that I want that to be in. Um, and now I know where that mark is and I can take it and move it there. And now that's the start of my track. Does that, uh, does that answer your question? I uh, kind of, it's helpful, but um, is there a way to actually see the video when you're trying to do your in and out points? Sometimes you get a client that has a video last minute and they want to see Sure. Let me let me open this back up uh, first. Um, and, great. Uh, so let's bring up the audition window again, and here I will play that and come back here and look at it. And let's say right there. That's where I want that start to be. Right there. Um, this video is set to infinite loop. That would have come out already uh, if I hadn't. But now I can kill the video and come back here and say this is, say this was the, uh, the in mark and that was the out mark that I wanted to take. And now, again, it's difficult to see because there's not much going on in this video. Um, but you see it's only running this section. Again, it's infinite looping, but now it's only running from here to here. Um, so that is how you set your... Uh, that would be the easiest way to set your in and out trim um, on on a, a manual mark or a visual mark. Um. Sorry, I was uh, answering some questions. That's okay. Uh, does anybody? Uh, so sorry. Uh, it uh, essentially though, there's no no way to drop a marker on a video. There's no um, video timeline per se. It's really the it, audio. You have the audio timeline. That's correct. Yeah. That's, that's essentially what we're getting to. Is sorry, Robert. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the best way to do it, you have to do it in conjunction with the audio. Um, editor window and uh and that's going to be the best way um i think sorry and correct me if i'm wrong ori uh my head's in a couple places at the moment um you can as you're playing the file can you drop marker with a uh with a hotkey yeah that's what i was saying you can you okay can sorry. Run, you can run m as the needle moves through the through the right. track um, and then you can drop your marks that way. Uh, right. But that, that is as close as you get. I, I, I now understand what you're asking, uh, Robert. There isn't anything like a, like a timeline uh, or, or, or like, a, like a thumbnail timeline, something that you can uh, scrub through and see. Um, Great. Let me, uh, let me just look and see if there was anything else on the – Facebook. Yes, please. Um, sorry, I was answering some of the questions that were coming up in the Facebook as text. Um, yeah, no, there, there's no other questions in the Facebook at this moment. Okay. 
Um, uh, Scott, I see your hand up there real quick before we jump on. It's a question, Ori. Yes. You know, I know that you can rent this program. Is there a way to download all the settings like onto a thumb drive so something happens to it from the next, you know, and you want to use that, that show lineup for another show down the road? Yes, absolutely. Um, so say I've finished building my show. It's just going to be these two cues. They've already been configured exactly the way that I want them to be. I can come up here to uh, file uh, and I can go to, I actually have a couple of options. If, if, uh, if all that I'm looking for is the settings that I've built in and not the cues, um, I can save as a template. Um, and you can save any number of templates for QLab and you should be able to, you can export them as well. Um, and uh, you can uh, bundle your workspace. Bundling your workspace collects a copy of all of the media that your uh, QLab file, your workspace uh, is referencing. So every video file that I've dropped in that it's referencing, every audio file that I've dropped in that it's referencing, every image, um, it will collect all of those and put together a folder that uh, carries the same name as my, Q, uh, as my QLab file. So in this case, it would be QLab Basics 1. Um, so it creates a folder called that, and inside that folder is a copy of this workspace and another folder labeled video, which has all the video and image files, and another folder labeled audio, which has all of the sound files. Um, the only things that you will probably still have to configure when you take that to a new setting, a new machine, a new venue, um, is uh, your display settings, your, your, your audio settings, your patches, um, because you're in a new device and your patches on this new device are different. Um, but aside from that, once you've set your patches, so say, say here in my display and geometry, surface two is what I have this set to. If I go into my video surface options here and I edit this surface, this is the surface editor. This is where you can also apply uh, warps. This is where you can do blending um, this is where you can throw a grid image up so you can straighten out if you're running through a projector. Um, and, uh, where you can set the, uh, the perspective, uh, of your image, um, of your final output image of your surface. So in here, um, all I would do would be to click this screen that I am currently mapped to in this, in this new machine, I would go and I would click this screen, I would click replace screen and I would pick whichever screen it is that I now want it to point to. And now every queue in my queue list that pointed to surface two will point to that new device, that new screen. Um, same with audio, my audio patch numbers are absolute within the workspace. Um, but I can change what devices are locked on with those patch numbers. Does that make sense? Yes, it sure does. So my understanding to make sure I'm clear is, although you're renting this program, there's some type of residual program left on your laptop, even though you're renting it, correct? That's correct. Uh, yeah, when we say rent, we mean uh, licensing. So, okay. so the, the software always lives on your machine. Um, you have to rent the, rent the license. Uh, it has to verify and then it just unlocks the features. Copy. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, one of the other things that's nice, um, here, if anyone's ever had a, like a playback pro, um, where the files were linked, like if you got someone else's show, 
and it because it really just generates links to the files on your machine to play them back um and then one of those is missing or it's in a wrong place and it becomes a hassle trying to find it uh, one of the things you can do with qlab is bundle those so that they all come together in the pro in the project file you can also not bundle them if you know you're going to always be on your machine and everything's in the same places um, but if you have to ship this thing out to somebody else uh, to put on a secondary machine or when you run a backup machine because uh, well, when you do get a license you get three positions as they're called you get oh, a seats, main yes yeah seats sorry you get a main seat a backup seat and a programmer seat so your license is actually for three machines that are supposed to be working on the same show and the designer seat is not supposed to output. Um, it's not supposed to be used as a show computer. It's just for the designer to fix and tweak things, but um, you would want to bundle your projects to transfer them between machines uh, so that everybody ends up on the same page and you don't have any missing files or links or anything. Yes, exactly. Um, bundling is, uh, is such a useful feature. I do it, uh, as often as I can. I try to make a bundle of my workspace at the end of each day I'm working on something. Um, so that I can always fall back and, uh, and fill stuff back in if need be, um, from a previous iteration. Uh, and then, of course, as with any program, save early, save often. Um, my finger is constantly near Command S when I am actively programming. Um, as you saw before, the odd behavior when I drop the queue in, occasionally, like any uh, inexpensive software, uh, QLab will experience bugs here and there. Um, typically, they are resolved by just quitting the app and relaunching it. Um, and I think I've only had a handful of instances that have been any more dire than that uh, in the last 10 years. So uh, the next thing that I wanna show you guys is a text queue. Um, Cause these are very useful if you wanna create uh, lower thirds or if you wanna like quickly generate uh, some kind of Chiron um, just to give some information, some context about what's going on on screen. Um, so I'm gonna come into the text tab of this text queue and I'm gonna change it to QLab Qs, keeping it nice and original. Um, so you see, if I come down here, I clicked on this font uh, font editor, the font panel, um, and I have the same the same font tools that you will see in most pieces of software font editors. Um, so let's say, great, I've picked. That's how I want this to look. So let's X out of that, and let's come over here to display a geometry. Oh no. Look at that, the queue is so much smaller than I had in my head based on that font. Well, I don't need to go back and forth to the font editor uh, because this text queue, like the video queues, has uh, scaling and geometry adjustments. So I can just pick it up there. I don't need to keep going back and re-editing the text. Um, if things change again, I can tweak the size on the fly. Um, here, as you will see. Any adjustments that I make can be made live, as you can see in the output window there. Um, I can cut the opacity, uh, and I can set translation points um, by doing it down in the inspector window or by doing it uh, within the uh, the display pane. Um, and then of course I can rotate as I could anything else. Um, here we also have, this was also under the video tab, uh, video effects can be applied. Uh, QLab has a number of built-in effects um, that I would recommend you play around with on your own. Um, 
and yeah, let's say I like this. Um, so now I have these cues and I can fire them one after another. I can fire space and then now that space is up, I can take the, the cue and I can hit spacebar again and bring that up. But let's say I wanna bring them both up at the same time. Um, I can go over here and use what I had talked about, the auto continue. Um, and this is nice graphically if you're ever not sure which one is which. Um, auto continue is that triple arrow auto follow, which is I will wait for this cue to finish and then go as that dot at the top to help you visually. Um, but let's set it to auto continue. And I panic the cue out and let's see what happens now if I run it. Now they're both up at the same time. Um, that's one way that you can build that. Um, the way that I actually prefer to do that is with a group queue, uh, which is what we'll get into now. So first thing I'm gonna do is take both of these queues and drop them into this group queue that I made. I'm gonna call this group demo. Uh, because it doesn't auto-populate the name like all of the other cues. Um, and uh, you can see I have a mode tab on the group cues. Um, I'm not going to get into these modes. Um, again, you can play around with them if you like, but I'd like to, in the interest of time, just move on to the timeline cues. Um, you see when I click that, I now have a timeline. And I can configure where in this timeline these cues will take place. Um, those of you who have worked with other timeline editors, this is probably very familiar. Um, so you can set your group cues in this way um, and build timed sequences. Uh, also what I was talking about before with recording your cues and outputting them, you'll end up with a timeline cue which will operate much like this. So let's say I want the rainbow and then I want one second to go by before QLab cues snaps in. So now I can hit go and there it is. Um, now let's say, uh, let's say I don't like that it snaps. It snaps in, it snaps out. Um, I wanna add a little more subtlety to this. So finally we're gonna look at, this is my favorite cue. Um, this is the fade cue. It is what I call the most powerful cue in QLab. Um, it will make all of your dreams come true. Um, I got two of them, it's so eager. Um, so what the fade cue does is it fades. I know that sounds simple, um, but it fades one or, or any number of the parameters that we've looked at on the audio cues, on the video cues, um, it fades any number of those parameters. So let's look at a video cue. I'm targeting that video cue with the fade cue now. And I can go look at any of these things and you see that everything here that I click through is at a basic setting. Let's say I wanna fade that video up. So let's go to the geometry tab because that's where we deal with opacity. And I'm gonna check opacity. So now the opacity is at 100%. This will fade up to 100% when that cue executes. So let me put this in here. I'll put it right after the rainbow uh, cue because you can't target something that isn't already playing with a fade. If you try to fade something that, that isn't there, QLab will just shrug and move on. Um, nothing will happen. So you gotta make sure if you're gonna fade something that it's already in place. So when I play this, I gotta reopen the audition window for you. When I play this, uh, oh, but the video didn't fade. Why didn't the video fade? Because my opacity on the original cue needs to be zero. So it's a little counterintuitive in that respect, um, but you wanna load anything that you want to fade up, you want to load in at zero 
and then have it fade up after the fact. Um, you can see if I go down to the timeline though, that those things are happening at the same time. So now let's see this again. I think I might be setting it a little too fast for the, uh, for the audition window, unfortunately. Um, oh, here we go. 0% on the video queue, as I said, 100% on the fade queue. Audition windows up. There you go. And because this rainbow nebula came after the QLab cues, you see it respected the layer. It's set to top layer. If I set it to any number that isn't top, because QLab cues is set to top, um, then, or bottom, uh, then I will have all layers of that sequence. There's, there's what, 999 layers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 999. I guess kind of you actually have a thousand and one, don't you? Because you could set something to bottom and you could set something to top and then you can set 999 other things. That, yes. that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure it's fade there. Um, moving on. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a single group queue built with a timeline mode. This is more or less what I, what I was trying to get you guys to. Um, and uh, I just want to show you guys uh, an example. This is what I was going to pull up before, or you saw briefly in the window. Um, but this is, this is the type of thing that you can program. Uh, I, I spent probably about... Uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, um, putting this sequence together and ironing out the kinks. And that includes uh, any time spent um, making the content. Uh, a friend of mine helped me make some of the audio tracks, but here you go. Oops, I, don't, I want to show you that on the real window. There we go. QLab is not selected. Okay. Zoom has been playing less nicely with QLab than I have had experience with OBS. whole sequence takes itself out too. And there you have it. Do we have any more uh, questions in the room or in the Facebook? So we have no questions in the Facebook. Someone did mention um, the opacity at zero, which you already corrected as you were doing it as part of your example. Um, obviously, just a reminder everybody that we are slightly delayed between us in the YouTube feed. So, you know, we try to get you guys as quickly as possible. Um, I was going to say, sorry, oh yeah, I apologize. I didn't speak more. I got uh, super engulfed in the, uh, <laughs> in what you were showing us here because I was trying to, to learn it as well. Cause I've, I've used it so little that, I, you know, you were teaching me little things here and there, little knit next, especially on the bottom panel here that I just, I've never used uh, to this level. So I was like, Oh shit, yeah. I should know this stuff. Cause there's definitely a couple scenarios where I've done this stuff for uh, the local 500 down here in, in Miami um, or in South Florida that I uh, could have done a better job, but um, it worked for what I did, <laughs> but now I know where the mistakes were. So thank you for that. Uh, now for future references, I'm, I'm much more prepared. Um, but yeah, again, guys, we still have, Plenty of time for Q&A uh, between the Facebook group and our, our guys here. 
I see Bodhi right now already has a question, so go ahead and let's dive into that. So you said this was only Mac specific. Um, can it be run off of an iPad solely, or is do you have to have the backup soft the backup program to do it over internet? So QLab itself will only run on Mac OS. Um, the QLab remote program uh, runs on iOS, and I believe it uses OSC to communicate um, with QLab. So you can, it, it, it helps you fire your cues that way. Um, but you can do a lot more than just fire the cues. You can do surface editing um, and a lot of the deeper features uh, if you run the remote on an iPad. Um, as far as a standalone program on a, on a tablet, um, QLab also has a piece of software called GoButton. Um, it does not run video. It does run audio. So you can use GoButton by itself uh, to run uh, audio um, tracks, to sequence them, to make cuts, to run secondary triggers like what we had reviewed. Um, and GoButton is also free to use. Um, and Go button actually is fully featured in the free version. The only thing that you cannot do is maintain more than one show file. Okay, so every every show you have to remake a new show. You can't open like I seen on yours, like at the bottom. It showed you had three listed shows, basically showing three lists. You can't have. You can only put one cycle in, and then you have to reuse. On on Go button, yes, but um. That again, that's the free version. The paid version, I think, is a hundred dollars, um, and that'll unlock you being able to load as many uh, shows onto there as you want. Um, that said, with the free version, uh, you can back your show up to Google Drive or Dropbox uh, via iOS. Um, I think you might even be able to do it to the Files app now, um, and you can maintain. Uh, a sort of off-site copy in that way that you can reload again uh, after whatever show you've done in the interim. Uh, Ori. Yes. So, oh, sorry, actually, Chris, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Uh, so someone has asked, is there no way to do any fading or transitions with video without the video license? Fading or trans? No, there, uh, unfortunately you cannot modify geometry without the video license um yeah, the, but fading you can't do fade cues uh no no it's because that's still that's you're 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 modifying the opacity which is one of the geometry features copy um you can you can fade audio cues uh in the free version you cannot yeah. fade video cues yeah i do that all the time right <laughs> Um, but I, I thought for some reason I thought you could do the, the, uh, the video ones, but only see it on the audition window, but no, it's been so long since I've used the free that I didn't remember that specifically. Um, someone else was asking if it's possible to get the QLab file to see your workflow. Um, I don't think we have a way to really make that available. Um, but to, to to get this QLab file, yeah, yeah, they want to they want to see the demo you just did. Sure, and, and sure, they want to see. It, what it, it's not that they want. It's to me, it's not that they want the file. They want to see what the workflow. the workflow build out looks like from what you were showing us to what that video entailed for the workflow. Yeah, right. yeah. I can uh, I can bundle that uh, once we're done with the stream, and uh, I can send it off to you, Ed. I'm sure we can find a way to get it out to people. Okay, so yeah, if anybody wants that, they should reach out to, or just live, he says. Okay, so yeah, I mean, what's the, I'll see if I can get more specific, specifics of what they're asking for. We are on okay. a bit of a delay, so it might be a little tough, but Steven, if you can give us, what specifically do you want to see? What, uh, what he's saying is, is like how he's built this queue out in here. He wants to see the workflow of that video that we saw. So do you have that available to show? Oh, to, to display it. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So this, like oh, I said, gotcha. I, I only spent about an hour on this. So this can be cleaned up more than I have it currently. 
Um, but here we have uh, the overriding group queue, and you can nest as many group queues as you want. That's why you see so many of these. Um, so you see the overriding group queue is housing my initial idea for a showcase, which I kept building until I decided that I needed an ending note. Um, and then I had the idea for the curtains. Uh, and I built this separately just because it was a little easier for me to program um, to bring in the two separate lines of text, the the end and still plenty of time for Q&A. Um, and then each of those, each of these are fading those uh, out. Or sorry, each of these are fading those in and this queue down at the bottom is fading and stopping. If you set a fade queue um, and you do this with a lot of video files uh, in your show, um, you wanna make sure that once you're done with that video and it's faded out and that's the last fade it's gonna take, you have this selected here. Uh, stop target when done. If you don't do that, the video will keep running in the background. Um, if it's an image specifically, uh, if it's, if it's a video and you haven't set it to loop, um, then it will just end when the video uh, counts out to its last frame. Um, but if you've set it to hold on the last frame, if you've set it to, uh, to loop, or if you just haven't run very much of the, like if you've got an hour on the tail uh, that you didn't bother to trim because you're fading out and that's the end of the video, um, then uh, you might end up over overrunning your uh, your resources on your machine. Um, so in order to avoid that, you want to make sure that you stop your target when done. Um, this stop target when done applies to the entire queue list, and I have targeted the opacity to zero, and I have targeted the audio levels out. So that's how that brings out all of the text cues that I had and the curtain and fades all of uh, the sound. Um, one thing I should probably touch on uh, over here for the curtain, uh, I decided that it wanted to supersede everything else and every, because once the curtain dropped in, everything behind it was unimportant. So I had it also fade and stop peers over one second once the curtain came in. Managing resources. You always want to keep uh, checking behind you as you go with QLab. Um, yeah, those are, those are great points. Uh, the management gets, uh, can get very hairy. Uh, I think earlier I, I heard you mention um, putting uh, load queues sometimes, like if you have a big file. Yes, uh, because QLab doesn't behave so well with the highly compressed formats uh, like H.264, um, it takes a lot of memory to uh, load and run your queues, your video queues, uh, especially the big ones, uh, the high resolution ones. So um, in order to give your computer enough time to load that all into the memory, uh, you can tick auto load in your queue. So as soon as the playhead is on it, it will begin the process of loading the queue. Or you can use uh, what's called a load queue somewhere earlier in your queue sequence so that it's ready to fire after a bunch of other queues all in a row. Right, if you had a stack of a, a ton of queues that were gonna rapid fire go, you might not wanna wait till it hits the playhead. Um, till the playhead gets to that queue, you might wanna put a load queue and have it in the in the gate, so to speak, uh, a few queues ahead, but not too many queues ahead because you don't want to eat up the resources. Right, exactly. Yeah. If I can throw one in there on that, please. Um, I also tend to use. I'm a big fan. We can talk about my unusual use cases in a bit. I'm a big fan of redundancy, running two machines, and one of my little quirks is I tend to run two different vintage machines on two different OS versions. Because if you're gonna have a bug, no sense having the same bug on both machines. 
And in that case, I find I tend to auto load a lot of even audio files because if you're doing with different generations of hardware and OS, the time it takes to actually bring it into the gate can be a little different too. So by having it preloaded, you don't have like, if one's an SSD and one's a mechanical drive, you don't have that lag too. That's a very good point and I didn't even think about this. So when, let me ask you, when you're doing primary, and I'm thinking here in my mind of a program called AV Playback in particular that does this, if I have my primary machine and I upload content to that machine, does that then also upload to my backup machine or am I doing the work twice? On both uh, you have to do it twice. You have to do it twice. Okay, okay. Again, the bundle makes it easy because you just cloud it over, USB stick it over, and it's a pretty easy copy. Got you. Okay. I, I like that information. I was curious. So again, Ori, I, I want to thank you for being here with us so much. We still we still have time, guys. I'm not wrapping this up. I just want to make another mention out to the to the Facebook community that we are on the live Q&A side. So ask your questions. Uh, we covered the basics of QLabs here. Ori did a fantastic job. I got totally sucked in the conversation, so I apologize. I wasn't more interactive. Yeah. Uh, so did the viewers here and everybody else. Uh, I will let you guys know who was new to the group. I see we have 26 viewers online right now. Uh, the way this format works is that we cover the basics of a program and your questions is how we dive deep into these conversations. So if you don't ask them, we won't dive into them. Uh, we will ask the questions that we want to know about and we'll dive deep into those questions. But the more you ask us, the more we'll dive into. And we have two great people here right now, Ori Ben, ben Simon, who's been doing this right now for us live, doing the demo, walking through it through us, provided you guys with content. And Justin as well, and the other half of this as well has been giving us a lot of great feedback and everything because they're both very good users of the program. Uh, so again, this is an opportunity for you guys to ask your questions and dive deeper and ask those questions you've been asking, wanting to know with people that use them. So these are the moments where within the chat here or within the group, you can ask those questions to us and we will dive down that rabbit hole as fast as we can with you until the two-hour mark is up. If there's a good moment, there's actually a couple of productivity things I'd love to call out if there's a good chance. Yeah. Do you have to do that? Do you want to run it, run it on your screen? Uh, I don't have it uh, easily accessible on this machine. I can just call it or, or he can bring it up on his. Um, it. One of the nice things about QLab that you don't know until you really get into it is just how fast the workflow can be. Um, day by day, I'm discovering just how much of the program you can drag and drop. Uh, as Ori showed, you can simply grab a file, drag it into a new queue. You can drag it into an existing queue. Uh, you can drag, just drag other queues within the groups or drag them out of it. You can select an entire crew, uh, group or queue, copy it, paste it really fast. And that's, as you do more of it, it's a real time saver. Because when you're sitting there going, click on the bar, select the file, it can be slow, but it'll really go, it should go in fast. Um, and the other useful thing in the preview window we didn't look at today but you do have when you're finding edit points you can zoom in and get very granular on it although one quirk you'll find if you're dealing with multi-channel files is the waveform it piles it up so i frequently do with cues that are music on one channel time code on the other and it'll just stack it up so it's just something you have to be aware of Great points. Thank you, Justin. Um, oh, and renumber. Renumber is your friend. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, I just... Uh, Ooh, or you, you, I've been this renumber thing. What's, what's renumber? Yeah, so, no. When uh, he talked about numbering, I was going to bring that up way yeah. at the beginning, but... Thank uh, you. Yeah. yeah uh, definitely. Uh, slipped me too. So you see, I've numbered this queue as E. As I said earlier, the number is a programmatic reference. Um, you can set it to whatever you want. Uh, you can either do that here or you can do that down here. But say, say I've built a lot of queues and I had them all numbered nicely, but now I've inserted a bunch of other effects in between things. And QLab has auto-generated those numbers as point queues and it starts to look very messy. Um, and it's difficult for me to track what's going on visually just by looking at the queue numbers. Or so what or I can Explain, yes. explain a point queue because not everybody's a theater. Thank you. Uh, so a point queue would be uh, basically as you get more and more granular, you can start with uh, say every sequence I will make at the top of a song, it will be lights 10. And then the next one will be lights 20. And the next one will be lights 30. 
Well, within that song, if the number of cues that I take is more than 10, uh, then I have to start getting more granular than whole numbers. So I start putting in points. And then the numbers themselves start to get very visually long on the page. Um, and it takes me more time to recognize them. And I can't just at a glance say, yes, this is what I'm looking for. This is the cue that I need to fire. Right. So a point cue would be if you had, if you threw something in between uh, Q2 and Q3, you might do Q2.1 or Q2.2 as uh, just to uh, get those numbers. If you really don't want uh, Q3 to change number, your director is very set and can't be told to renumber their cues. So you're going to tell them, okay, well then give me a Q2.1 call uh, for the show caller. Right. Um, so let's say, let's say an instance where I've, I've just layered in a lot of cues, but none of the numbers have been set in yet. I, I'm actually going to decide what the numbers are today. Um, and I want them to make sense for me. So I'm going to, in this instance, I'm going to select all. So command A, which is just your regular Mac shortcut for select all. Um, and I'm going to go up to here so, you can sh so I can show you guys, but there is also a shortcut that I generally use. I can delete the numbers of all selected cues, which if you're dealing with a, a really hefty stack and a lot of numbers, I recommend doing first. Um, just make sure you avoid that Q3 that the director absolutely needs to have. Uh, and after that, you can apply uh, renumber selected cues and it gives you this little window and here you can programmatically tell it to start at whatever number you like and increment by whatever number you like um i'm actually going to back out and do that again i'm going to do it with a shortcut uh because i want to only number the group cues and what's in this showcase so now that's all that's visible I'm going to select all, and I'm going to command R, which is the shortcut for renumbering. I'm going to start at one. I'm going to increment by one. Renumber. Now I have one through 12. If I open these groups up, they were not selected. It did not apply to them. So these cues are all still numberless, which is perfect for my needs. Um, and that is how you can very quickly get a very long queue list that you might have uh, rebuilt from something old uh, right back into order. Hey, so, or I'm not sure this is a question for you or for Justin. Uh, I have a question from Williams Childs. How do you use your backup machine? Uh, I asked for more details, but I, I haven't received any yet. So, William, if you're watching this, is there any more detail you want to give on that, or do you guys can you jump off of that one little sentence? Uh, Justin, if you'd like to jump in. Sure. And hey, that's prop time. Um, if I'm doing, I do some kind of unique shows. I do a lot of uh, large fireworks displays where you're kind of zero fail. So it's good to have two machines running so you can cut over from primary to backup, either mechanically switching or there are interfaces that'll do it for you. And one of my favorite pieces of hardware I have is a go box here that this one's actually keyboard emulator that emulates the go button the stop button queue up queue down play and pause and this one actually has two usb ports that have two independent keyboard emulators in it so whenever i hit the green go button it emulates hitting the space bar on both machines and if i up and down through cues they're up and down so the machines are always running in sync. So if I have a crash or a failure, you just punch the button or flip the switch and switch over so your show keeps running even if one of your two machines goes down. Gotcha, gotcha. I like that. So there's another question I'll, I'll throw out to the, I guess to both of you here, uh, from Steven Ramanada. I'm sorry if I messed that up, man. I apologize. Uh, when using OCS to trigger cues on your networking, lighting, and audio consoles, are there some do's and don'ts that you have experience with in terms of best practices and optimizing resources within a QLab workspace? Uh, that is word for word what he asked. I don't know who's the best to go for that. 
Um, well, I'll jump in with a little bit of it. Uh, in terms of optimizing your OSC uh, commands, there isn't much that you need to worry about from that end. The OSC commands themselves running out of QLab, it's very little data that's being sent out. They're very short strings generally. Um, what, uh, what you really need to watch if you're going to be running uh, your show network uh, with OSC is to make sure that you are fully dedicated. Um, that means no uh, extraneous traffic on that network uh, because OSC packets are notorious for being dropped. Um, but uh, if, you, if you have good network etiquette, um, then you're going to be pretty safe with what you do with OSC. Uh, I would say in terms of what you can do on the output end, uh, just to avoid flooding uh, whatever switch or router you're, you're sending things through would be to avoid the broadcast address. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, you can pretty safely send a lot of them in, uh, in a pretty tight sequence. And before we jump to Andres, uh, Justin, you have anything that you want to add to that one? or? Should... No, I think Ori covered it pretty thoroughly. Okay. Um, and Andres, yeah, you have a question? Wait, sorry, before we move on. Hey, Justin, I saw, you know, I, I know I'm familiar with that, uh, that box you have. It, I, I feel like I've opened that thing up and changed the buttons on it. Yeah, maybe. Um, <laughs> but uh, would, um, would you switch over to using something like a Stream Deck? Uh, and companion to trigger would, your machines. It depends on the scenario. Um, one of my rather unconventional compared to other people here use cases is I do a lot of fireworks displays. And this actually came with very nice light above the surface buttons and the work Ed was uh, talking about, I changed these to buttons that are below the surface that you really have to mash because in that world, accidentally firing a cue is a bad thing. So in theater work, I would probably go to a stream deck in a heartbeat. But, you know, if I'm sitting outside at night and an Axel Go button gets somebody hurt or spends a lot of money, not really. Um, which, just to tail on to that, when we're talking QLab preferences, in the general settings, one of the options is double go protection. You can say, after you hit go, do not accept another go input for X number of seconds, which a lot of times if I'm doing shows that don't tie cues, I'll set it to not take another go for 10 seconds. So you can't accidentally double tap the button or have a fault that gives you an extra trigger. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times I have um, hit go uh, twice just because... I'm not thinking and I'm used to something else and someone's like, Oh wait, no, no, stop that. And I hit enter again, instead of going to escape for panic out. And uh, now I've got two cues playing that are both wrong and I'm getting yelled at. So. Yeah. Um, I generally figure out what my shortest sequence will be and set a little shorter than that. So. Copy that. Um, which uh, before we get to Andreas, that's a, a good point. Um, QLab works with stream deck. Um, and Stream Deck is something we're going to be covering uh, next week on AV Tech Talks. So um, any of you uh, QLab users um, who are looking for other ways to control your QLab, uh, come back next Monday. Uh, we will have a presentation on uh, Companion and Stream Deck, which uh, apparently uh, yesterday there was a huge, uh, huge um, dumping uh, of a new version of Companion that uh, has a ton of new features. So um, hopefully we can we can pull some of that in. I know uh, Nat had some of his presentation already uh, built, so we'll see uh, how much of the new stuff he can he can integrate. Um, I did notice that the A10 Mini Pro was on the uh, the list of uh, new additions, so that that's pretty uh, pretty cool. So definitely check that out with us next week. Um, and it's not just control of QLab; it's control of many things. I know uh, somebody brought up Playback Pro in the uh, comments. It can control Playback Pro and, and a ton of other uh, other software and hardware, OBS. So, uh, and now actually somebody I saw, which I'll try to post in the, in the 
links next week uh, created a plugin for Zoom. So uh, pretty soon, once I put my stream deck right in front of me, I may not have to touch any other pieces of hardware. Um, it should but be I, totally ideal. Yeah, no, that would be great. Uh, I think Andreas had a question earlier that we had uh, skipped a couple times. If uh, he wants to go back to that, it was on the cart. So are we on the cue cart? Yes. Can you do pages inside the cue cart? Or can you change the layout to get more fixed uh, physical buttons on it or no? Um, so no, you are... Um... You, you so mean the, if in, I'm in not mistaken, of, yeah, like the I'm rows mistaken, and uh, okay. yeah, on um, the old version, you could change some of the layout. Um, I'm trying to remember where that is. Uh, honestly, I'm not sure off the top of my head, it's probably in the workspace settings. Um, oh. After you find that while you're in workspace settings, maybe if you can talk about some of uh, those uh, workspace settings like for audio and video, because uh, we kind of went through patching, but. Yeah, we brushed over them a little bit. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, if we look a little deeper into uh, the audio settings, for instance, um, here there's a handy little button that will link you to audio MIDI setup, which you will need if you end up following that tutorial to integrate with uh, OBS because you will need to set up an aggregate device for that, um, which is also covered in that tutorial. Uh, you can set your system-wide uh, volume min and max over here. Um, so that'll apply to all of your outputs. Um, and then if I want to dive a little deeper, here we have Q outputs and device routing and device outputs. With device outputs, we can add an effect directly to the output of the device. Um, device routing uh, lets us go through the cross points matrix and uh, pick and choose uh, where our Q outputs are sent. Uh, I'm sorry, our inputs are sent. Uh, so you see here, this is L and R. It's not labeled as such, but I know that those are the first two channels on this audio device. Uh, so one and two, one and two, and here we have left going into left, right going into right. Um, and we can select any of the audio devices that our computer sees. Uh, so if your Mac sees it as an audio device in your system settings, QLab will see it as well. Um, coming over here to the video settings, uh, we, dug on this, we dug into this a little bit, uh, but you can click displays. is also a nice little pop-out pane for, uh, I'm sorry, not a pop-out pane. It will bring up your uh, system preferences pane uh, for displays. So you can adjust your, your your physical displays before you make the adjustment to your surfaces, which is always the recommended order to do that in. Uh, you wanna deal with things in the physical world and then get more and more digital as you go along. Uh, so first I would set up my display or my projector in the real world. Then I would come in here and I would make sure that in my max display settings, uh, everything is as it should be in terms of my resolution, my arrangement. Um, and then I would come in here and either add a new empty surface where I could start punching in my resolution manually um, or add with display uh, where it will automatically populate the resolution of this display. It will automatically line up the display with the surface that I create um, and set all of the origins uh, uh, and all of the corners uh, automatically. So let's say uh, new surface with this monitor here. As you can see, everything here is automatically in line. I can drag it back out of line if I want. 
Um, but here, let's exit out of this and I'll show you what it looks like to just populate it with a new empty surface because you may want to do this. Um, say I have a graphic that I want to show uh, over my screen and this position is where I'm always going to play graphics. I know this every single time I'm going to throw a graphic into this presentation. I'm going to want it to show up there and I'm going to want it to show up at that scale as well. So in this instance, I can create a surface and I can call it graphic. And let's say it's 1024 by 768, just for, for argument's sake. Um, so the graphic is 1024 by 768. The screen that we put it on is 1920 by 1080. So now that's where the graphic will show up within the screen. And I can adjust that by moving the screen about. If I want it dead center, if I want it justified to the bottom. Um, now, these corner finning points are how you adjust your warp in QLab. So if, if and, I were projecting. Sorry, and you have, uh, I think I see you have um, X, Y coordinates that you could punch that in if you had specific places you wanted them, correct? Where that origin? Yes. Yeah, well, my origin, yes, that's right. So as you can see, I can move them around that way. I can punch them in directly uh, as numbers, or yeah, I can drag in this box to sort of find adjust. Um, so the, let's make this zero, zero. Um, the corners are where you would adjust your warp if you were projecting. So let's see the addition window. I'm actually not sure if this will, oops. Uh, no, it will actually output the grid on the, on the physical display, whether or not the audition window is open. Um, yeah, we saw that there for a second. Yeah. But that was with the warp. I'll, I'll, uh, here you can, I'll show it to you again. So you can see that's the warp that I applied in there. This is what it looks like here. If I bring it in, as you might expect, um, and I bring the grid back up. Now it looks very, very wrong. Right. Um, so yeah, and, th and this is the page. If you had multiple surfaces, you could do your blending uh correct and things uh, like that yeah which so. i mean today we were uh we were looking at covering basics um if if there's a, a an interest in learning that kind of stuff um we can maybe have ori back and, and touch on some of that it's a little hard when we don't have projectors that we can uh we can show you with right, and, but and point another camera at <laughs> yeah exactly um but if it's something that a lot of people want to see uh i'll try to figure something out um but uh, I think we had a couple comments in on Facebook that uh, the cue cart has a grid size tab at the bottom. Grid size tab at the bottom of the cart. Yeah. So that's yeah, it's one of the tabs on the control pane. Oh, that's right. That's where that is. So yes, this is where you can change your grid sizes. You are limited to these. Um. If you need more cues than that, honestly, I would recommend either going with the Stream Deck uh, and firing OSC cues from the Stream Deck, uh, which reference the cue numbers of uh, play cues. Um, or I would uh, fire OSC directly from the Stream Deck that will. Uh, so you, an, an, an OSC command that you can use is. Uh, you can select a queue number uh, or a queue list, a queue number, and tell it to just fire. Um, so that's what I would probably do is to set up a custom surface or a stream deck um, for any more than this. Um, somebody else had asked, um, what about the reverse sending OSC from external consoles to QLab? I've heard that there's a greater risk of dropped packets. 
So if you're using like a lighting desk to control it. I have not run into a greater risk. I find that once I've cleaned up my network nicely, um, I have not run into that issue. Uh, I've certainly heard some people having more difficulty in going that direction. Um, a lot of the mystification about that is uh, it, it really just comes down to making sure that your your network messages are, are being addressed properly or going the right place. Um, for, for QLab out, I can create a new patch. Um, for QLab in, QLab will listen, but if I'm across a network where my ports might, like if I'm not across a private network, if it's remotely being triggered, uh, my ports would need to be forward forwarded. Uh, if I'm behind a private network, then I need to make sure that uh, I'm pointing at the correct ports still. Uh, QLab by default listens for OSC on port 53,000. Um, and it also listens for UDP on 53, 53, 5. Um, but a lot, yeah, most of the trouble that I, that I encounter comes down to either the IP address or the port number um, or things being confused on the lighting consoles and in terms of uh, transmit and receive um, because uh, QLab will uh, listen on a different port than it uh, sends. Um, you, can, you can configure what port that it sends on. Um, you cannot adjust what port it listens on. Got it. So great, Ori. Thank you. I think we're getting close to the end of time. Uh, if you can uh, maybe stop sharing your screen for a moment. Oh, you got it. Sorry. No problem. And, and we're back. So and real quick, I just wanted to thank Ori tremendously for being here with us. Uh, obviously, we were sucked in this conversation. We were learning a lot from you. You taught us a, a lot of stuff. Thank you for the community out there who commented. I see there's two ones that we did not get to yet, and I apologize for that. We will come back to you guys on the post side and get to those questions that you have in the comment section. We won't leave you hanging, I promise. Um, but I wanted to let Bodhi close this one off today and, again, give a special thanks to Ori today for being here with us and for Justin for helping us out as well on the audio side. Special thanks for Ed for getting us all together with us and for Bodhi and me for being here with you guys. And again, real quick, it's nine o'clock. I know we all have things to do. I got to spend time with my daughter who's here. Uh, I know Bodhi's got a stream to do, so I'll have you close us off real quick and give a little shout out to that and uh, we'll call it a day. All right, guys. Ori, thank you. That was that, like Omar said, definitely got sucked into that. That was definitely interesting. I uh, wish I can use it more on the Windows side than the Mac side, but that's my preference. Not everybody's mm -hmm. that way. Uh, um, but guys, definitely want to be here next week. We are going to be doing that uh, Stream Deck com, uh, companion app. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, I actually have a few things that I can pull up for showing for how to do streams and stuff like that, where you can do file compressions and stuff, where you can have a hundred script thing to operate your entire computer run off a button push. Uh, but with that, we're out for the night, guys. Have a great night. Catch me on my page in about five minutes. It's Toxic Biowolf, facebook.gg Toxic Biowolf. Come hang out. Come have fun. Great. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah, it looks like we're clear. Boom. Awesome job. Hey, man, Aura, I really got sucked in, dude. I'm so sorry. Between you and the <laughs> mother on commenting.